Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 through 7. In our introductory message this morning, we'll be showing the difference between the dispensationalists' view of the Sermon on the Mount and the amillennialists' view. We'll do that so we can know exactly what we're faced with in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. Before we begin, I have a list of questions that I read to the congregation Wednesday evening and a brief answer to each question. I'm going to read these questions and the answer before each service beginning this morning. I'm talking about our Sunday services. I'll read them again this evening. I'll read them next Sunday. And I may read them for a month or maybe two months. These are important questions. And hopefully you'll see why that I'm doing this. I have always desired, I have been striving for, not only in my teaching and preaching, but personally, I'd like to see Christ's assembly I'm talking about the local aspect of the assembly here. Be one that really could receive the blessings that God has in store for us. I do not believe that we have reached that place. And we never will reach the standard that God himself has given for the assembly. However, there is something for which we are to strive. Having said that, you'll see my point when I start reading these questions and giving the answer before we begin the introductory message to the Sermon on the Mount. Question number one. What is the difference between this assembly and most assemblies? The only major difference is theory. And what I mean by theory is well-established propositions that have been proved from the scriptures to be factual. So the only major difference is theory. However, theory, apart from practice, increases judgment. If you are not well established in theory, it is because of one of the following things. Number one, you have not applied yourself in the study of the scriptures. Number two, you are disobedient to the truth you have been taught, which prevents your understanding additional truths are number three you are incapable of understanding spiritual things folks that takes in the whole spectrum question number two what is fellowship it is God's people Watch my emphasis. Walking together in obedience to truth with a common goal which results in experiential joy. Now that's the most concise definition I can give of fellowship. Question number three. What is division? It is persons in the assembly determined to do something for personal benefit rather than for the benefit of the assembly. Furthermore, it is the alienation of feeling and party strife. Persons who are willfully ignorant of biblical principles 
constitute the biggest problem to the assembly. Division does not come from outside enemies, but it comes from either the assembly's internal carnality or from apostates within the assembly. After all, how can two walk together except they be agreed? Question number four. What is unity? Spiritual unity does not mean the destruction of individual thinking. But it is the molding of our collective Christian thinking within the mind of Christ. Next question. What is the result of knowing these principles and failing to maintain them? God will remove the lampstand, thus closing the door of opportunity. The next question. What characterizes Christ's friends? Christ said, speaking to his disciples, you are my friends if you shall do what I command you. What characterizes the under-shepherd's friends? As Christ's under-shepherd, I say to you, You are my friends only as we strive to follow the principles of Scripture. A concluding remark. The effect of God's promises is to stimulate zeal. Hence, To expect the fulfillment of promises without working is to test God. And to work without expecting their fulfillment is to dishonor God. Now open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 5. While you're opening your Bibles to that portion of Scripture, let me stress that every Christian at some time, and maybe many times, and I'm sure many times in all of our lives, every Christian steps over the line. The question of importance is how and when does he bounce back? Don't ever think that you, as a believer, have not or you're not capable of stepping over the line. No three chapters in the New Testament are any greater for you and me than Christ's first major sermon, which was given directly to his disciples, although there were others who heard him as he spoke. I want to give some introductory things before we read the first ten verses this morning. We'll be discussing the first ten verses of Matthew 5 in both services today. There is much talk today about a new order of society. Ideas and plans are being discussed. Changes are taking place. 
But are these changes for the better? They are not. You know they are not, and I know that they are not. A week ago, I heard about a conference in Geneva, Switzerland, on the subject, quote, how to eliminate anger, end of quote. I listened to the main person who was there. In fact, he helped organize it. It was a meeting of psychologists. And you know what I think of psychologists, including all the so-called Christian psychologists. But their subject was how to eliminate anger. The man who was interviewing the man in charge of this meeting in Geneva, Switzerland, was given an illustration by the person who was the host of the program interviewing the man. And the man acted like he was horrified by what this man said. And I'll not even tell you what he said. But after listening for a few minutes, how to eliminate anger. Well, hatred and anger is going to be one of our subjects in the fifth chapter of the gospel according to Matthew. As I listened, these thoughts came to my mind. I wonder if these psychologists who were meeting dealt with the subject of God's anger. Nothing said about God or God's anger. You see, the scripture says God is angry with the sinner every day. Psalm 7:11. Nothing was said about the Christian's anger. Their conference was on the subject of just eliminating anger. We are told in Ephesians 4.26, You be angry and sin not. There is a holy anger. There is a righteous anger. Christians know, maybe I should say it like this, informed Christians know that a new order of society is out of the question until the completed assembly which Jesus Christ is now building Matthew 16, 18, and saved Israel of the future are in their divinely appointed places, and that being the future kingdom. Now, there are some other things I'd like to say, but folks, we don't have time to say all we'd like to say. As we look around us today, we are shocked at a low level of human behavior. Not only in the world, but especially in the realm of professing Christendom. Is this what Scripture predicts? Yes, folks. It is what Scripture predicts. There is so much superficiality today. I'm not talking about superficiality in the world society. I'm talking about superficiality in the realm of professing Christendom. This morning in going through the Houston Pope, Post. There was a little magazine called USA. I'm not 
up on the post and all of its uh, magazines yet. I've just started taking it. But war on aging. War on aging. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting subject? I didn't know that science can keep us from getting old, did you? Science cannot lengthen a person's day on this earth by one day. There's appointed time to be born and there is an appointed time to die. We hear so much today about cosmetic surgery. <laughs> See, we laugh at those things. I laugh at them. People are not satisfied with the way they look. They're beginning to age, and so they want to do something about the aging process. So they'll have a facelift, or they'll have that kind of a lift, or something else. War on aging. It all boils down to this. In society, people are appearing what they are not. But, folks, that is not only true in the society of the world. It is also true in professing Christendom. Too many people are trying to appear to be what they are not. Superficiality. For instance, to use a biblical term, having a form of godliness but denying the power of Christianity. Christ's sermon on the mount came at a time when the religious leaders were misrepresenting what God had said to Moses. For example, you will find six times in the fifth chapter Christ said, to the people to whom he was speaking, primarily to the disciples. You heard that it was said, but I am saying to you. Just as the religious leaders of Christ's day were misrepresenting what God said through Moses, False teachers today are misrepresenting what God the Father said through His Son and through the apostles who completed the Scriptures for you and for me. The two major sermons of Jesus Christ were delivered on mountains. The Greek word is or us. It means either a mountain or a hill. And where the Lord Jesus assembled with his disciples was not a mountain in the terms that we would think of Pikes Peak in Colorado. So the first sermon was spoken on a hill or a mountain. And his concluding sermon, Matthew chapters 24 and 25, concluded his ministry, his public ministry. It was also spoken from Mount Olivet. His first discourse was not only devoted to correcting the misrepresented law, and it's continuing to be misrepresented as we will show in our study of Matthew 5, which God gave to Moses, but also to present the characteristics of the heirs of the kingdom. Notice what I said. And this is the portion we will be reading this morning. And folks, I've had the I've had the time of my life studying it. In the first verses of Matthew 5, we have eight characteristics 
of the heirs of the kingdom. And the order in which they are given will amaze you. And the meaning of each one. There are nine references to the kingdom in this Sermon on the Mount. And that tells us something. Since the meek are the humble, and this is one of the Beatitudes, since the meek are not inheriting the earth, I'm not inheriting the earth, and you're not inheriting the earth in its biblical meaning in Matthew 5, And since we are not inheriting the earth during the period of time between the two advents of Jesus Christ, the promise is this, the meek shall inherit the earth. And folks, that is a future active indicative verb of clay ronameo. The earth will be inherited by the meek or the saints of God, not during the time between the two advents. It was not inherited at Christ's first advent. It is not being inherited today. And it will not be inherited until it is a new earth prepared for the new Jerusalem that shall come down from God out of heaven. And the proof of this is 2 Peter 3.13, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10, and finally, Revelation 21 and verse 1. Hence, the kingdom on the earth is the kingdom to come for which Christ taught us in chapter 6, verse 10, by saying, let your kingdom come. Folks, that's future. Now I want us to look for a few minutes at what the dispensationalists teach on this particular portion of Scripture, Matthew 5 through 7. And I'll give you just some of the basic things of what the amillennialists say. (coughs) Dispensationalists say Christ's discourse, identified as the Sermon on the Mount, was given at a time when the kingdom was being offered to Israel. And when Christ was instructing the disciples not to go to the Gentiles. They further state that the covenanted kingdom offered to Israel was rejected. And having been rejected, it is postponed until the second advent. Now that's bad enough. And I'll refute that with just two or three statements this morning. We'll not give all the arguments. We'll be doing this for weeks and months to come, the Lord willing. One of the worst statements that the dispensationalists could make is that this sermon is not for the church of Jesus Christ. Now think this through for a moment. Now let me ask you a question. Think about the scriptures. We have been presenting to you that when one has an overall view of scripture, when a statement is made, he starts reflecting on the scriptures as a whole to see if that statement will harmonize with the overall teaching of God's word. 
If they're going to say this is a message for the kingdom and not for the church today, and the kingdom is filled with prophecies concerning the eschatological kingdom, then you would have to say that the Old Testament is not for us. And there are religionists, there is one denomination in particular that doesn't even want to consider the Old Testament because they say it is not for us today. We're not under the Old Covenant, we're under the New Covenant. If that is true, then what about Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 10 when he used in writing to the Corinthian Christians showing the analogy between the Israelites of old and the actions of the Corinthians themselves and then said these things were written for our admonition. You see, the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and the Scripture, all the Scripture is for our edification. I don't believe that people are in a position to understand the New Testament properly without a workable knowledge of the Old Testament. Because the New Testament was concealed in the Old, and the Old is revealed in the New. So it takes all of Scripture. Now, I don't like the departmentalization of Scripture as many are doing today. And yet, watch this, I don't care what one says, somebody could take exception to it. There is a sense in which we are to departmentalize. But folks, we don't carry it to that extreme. We don't carry it to that extreme. All Scripture is for our edification. Now, when the dispensationalist talks about the postponement of the kingdom, listen to this for just a moment. And I'm calling it false teaching. What else can I call it? The false teaching of a postponed kingdom is refuted by the prediction of two forerunners. I want to give you a little different approach to this this morning. If the Jews had received the so-called offered kingdom when Christ came the first time, watch this, the prophecy of Elijah was false And read it for yourself, Malachi 4, 5 and 6. Furthermore, if the Jews had received Christ, thus making John Elijah, which some teach, is also false because he did not fulfill Malachi 4, 5 and 6. Nor was he associated with the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 13, which was a foretaste of the coming kingdom. Lastly, John definitely stated in John 1, 21, that he was not Elijah. Therefore, God is not unsure of the outcome of his purpose. John the Baptist was the first forerunner of Jesus Christ. Elijah would be the forerunner of the second advent of the Savior. Two forerunners. And since God is not unsure of the outcome of his purpose... He gave no contingency. I said, He gave no contingency. For those who restrict Matthew 5 through 7 
as the code of laws, especially for Christ's earthly kingdom, which he will set up in the future, must be strongly rejected for the following reasons. Number one, the earthly conditions portrayed in the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, listen to me, please. Do not coincide with the Old Testament prophecies concerning the coming kingdom. And I'm going to give you three major prophecies of the Old Testament to illustrate my point. I'll not take time to read them or refer to them. You can do that. Isaiah 11, 3, 4, and 9. Amos 9, 13 through 15. And Malachi 4, verses 3 through 5. In order to understand the prophecies in connection with Matthew 5 through 7, one must distinguish between the millennium, the thousand years, watch this, as a transitional period and the eternal state of the kingdom. Some non-dispensational pre-meals, and I have found some in my research work lately, and it was a joy to find them, say the state of perfect universal peace prophesied does not harmonize with peacemaking, and that's one of the Beatitudes this morning. Think about this. Persecution, perseverance, murder, adultery, etc. Now, they make some tremendous statements. And you know that the glory of the Lord is not covering the earth now as the waters cover the sea. So what we find in these three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, will not harmonize with what they're talking about. Number two. The apostles did not herald Christ as king. The apostles did not herald Christ as king. You can't find it, folks. Now, the only so-called proof text that is used is found in John chapter 1 and verse 49. When Nathanael said, You are the king of Israel. Well, he was born king. But this statement was made by Nathaniel as a novice. And don't forget, Peter made a terrible blunder in the 16th chapter of the gospel according to Matthew when he tried to keep the Lord Jesus from going to the cross. So you can see that they were novices until they were properly instructed. Peter's message subsequent to Pentecost proves the non-postponed kingdom. Acts 3, 18 through 21. And that's enough said for the time being. And number three, the kingdom of prophecy has not taken on a different form from what was predicted in the Old Testament. Dispensationalists say the kingdom's present form is one of mystery. Now watch this. However, the kingdom is never presented as a mystery. There may be mysteries of the kingdom, while the kingdom itself may be known. You must make that distinction. This fact is understood when one considers the mystery of salvation. Colossians 1.27 When Paul spoke of the mystery of salvation, all of us being in Christ. It's a mystery. I can't explain it. You can't either. I understand that I'm in Christ. I understand it on the basis of truth. Truth revealed in Holy Scripture. Having said that, I must tell you this. 
It was Friday evening. My wife and I were both tired. We thought we'd relax a little before we went to bed. I turned on. She doesn't like Channel 14 very well, but I turned it on because it's that wild station. And a woman was giving her testimony. They really like to use women. And so this woman was talking to, I don't know how many husbands she had had, but she was looking at one and she said, when my husband with whom I had not gotten a divorce and they had parted the way, living separately, she said, I was so attracted to him, one that she's married to now, and she said, I became attracted to him and I went home and said, the Lord spoke to me and said, wait a minute, you haven't gotten a divorce yet. <laughs> Don't you become attracted to someone until you first get a divorce. Folks, the Lord is blamed for a lot of things of which He is not guilty. The voice she heard was not the voice of God. It was the voice of the devil speaking to her. I just want you to know the age in which we're living, folks. And you know it. But we're subjected to it over and over again. Over and over again. So I understand that I'm in Christ. I understand it experientially. I'm not the same person I was. But I am not yet the person that I desire to be, even here, before being glorified in the presence of Christ. There is another mystery, the mystery of the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ without controversy or confessedly grave, is the mystery of godliness. God being made manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3.16 It's a mystery. I understand it. I accept it on the basis of revealed truth. But it still has some mysterious things about it that I don't understand and never will. Because I'm not God. And furthermore, I never will be God. I won't ever be a God, as the Mormons teach. Now, having stated some, some, some things about the dispensationalist, what about the amillennialist? Amillennialists say the kingdom of Old Testament prophecies is God's rule in the spiritual sphere. It was introduced by Daniel in Daniel 2, 34 through 46. Now, folks, anybody who can read Daniel 2, 34 through 46 and spiritualize that, he can spiritualize anything. I said he can spiritualize anything. He can be as wild as that woman who said, the Lord spoke to her. And said, now wait a minute, keep your eyes off of me until you've gotten a divorce. But they say that this spiritual sphere was introduced by Daniel and described... And we'll give the rest of it. And described by Matthew in Matthew 5, 3 through 12. And those are the verses that give to you and me the eight characteristics of the heirs of the kingdom. Furthermore, they say that the kingdom is a gratuity, not an acquisition. Because it is for babies, poor, publicans, and sinners. I'm quoting a man that you would be very familiar with if I were to give his name. 
but a lot of folk have said this, and so I'll just use the statement. They say the kingdom has come, is coming, and is yet to come in the hearts and lives of God's people. That's our millennialism. If the kingdom is the reign of Christ in the heart, according to the amillennialist, what kind of kingdom is going to be established at Christ's second coming for which the heirs of the kingdom are commanded to pray, let your kingdom come? We agree with the amillennialists that there is a better society now. Watch this. There is a better society now. But let's explain what kind of society. They don't go into it very far, so I'll spend a little time giving an explanation. Yes, I agree with the amillennialist who says there is a better society now. But this new society is in the midst of a society controlled by the spirit operating in the sons of disobedience. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Furthermore, There is nothing in this worsening society. I want that to soak in. There is nothing in this worsening, worsening society that the elected society is being called and prepared for the perfect and eternal kingdom. So it is from this worsening society that Almighty God is calling out the elect and preparing them for the eternal kingdom. And as long as He has a chosen one living in this worsening society... His judgment is restrained until that one has been brought into the ark of safety. I'd like to say one other thing about this Sermon on the Mount. According to Matthew, Christ evidently repeated portions of this sermon. That's all I'm going to say. And if you want why I said that and reason why I said that, study when you have time, Luke 6, 17 through 49. You will find in that portion of Scripture, Luke records only some of the things that Christ dealt with in Matthew. That means you're going to have to study not only Matthew and know the purpose in writing Matthew, and for whom it was written, primarily speaking, and Luke's account of some of the things, and consider to whom Luke was writing, and the purpose for which he was giving his message. But it must be considered that Christ did repeat. And when he repeated, he didn't give it all. It wasn't necessary. He gave what was appropriate for that time being. So when you read Luke chapter 6, of course you're not going to say what higher criticism says. And that is, there is a contradiction between Luke and Matthew. There was no contradiction between Luke and Matthew. Now that brings us to the reading of the scriptures. So open your Bibles. And we'll have time to present it and give a few points. And folks, this is so outstanding. So outstanding. 
Let's read beginning with verse 1, Matthew chapter 5. And I'm not going to read all this morning. Hopefully, we'll be able to cover the first 16 verses today. I said, hopefully. But let's just read the first 10 verses, and I will state why I am not reading verses 11 and 12. And seeing the crowds, he went up on a mountain, and having sat down, his disciples came to him. Now notice it was his disciples who came to him. And having opened his mouth, he was teaching them, saying. Now we begin with the eight Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of the heavens. Blessed are the ones mourning. We have a participle there. So blessed are the ones mourning, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, or the humble, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure, or the clean, in heart, for they shall... The King James says, see. The verb that is used in the Greek is horao. And folks, it is not better translated see. It's better translated understand. So look at verse 8. Blessed are the clean in heart, for they shall understand God. Now you appreciate this more when I give you a rundown on all eight attributes. Verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And finally, the last. Verse 10, blessed are the ones who have been persecuted. There we have a perfect passive participle. For the sake of righteousness. And then he says, for theirs is the kingdom of the heaven. Now, why am I stopping at this point? I am stopping because in verses 11 and 12, the Lord Jesus is not giving this just generally speaking. He is now particularizing what he says. So let me prove that. We'll go ahead and read verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you, blessed are you, watch this, blessed are you when they may reproach and persecute you and may say every wicked thing against you, speaking untruths because of me. Now your King James says for the sake, it is true that there is an adverbial a preposition used according to your Greek, if you look at it, and it is translated in your Greek in linear for the sake of. But after studying this diligently, I can't accept that, and it sounds better to me, and I'll tell you why later. Because of me. Now, verse 12. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is in heaven. For thus they persecuted the prophets. Now here's, here's the key to it. They persecuted the prophets before you. 
So he was actually making application in verses 11 and 12 of the persecution as it related to the disciples whom he had called as he began his speaking. Now we'll spend, we could spend a little time on the, some other introductory things, but let me point out these eight Beatitudes. The Greek word for blessed here is makarius, and makarius can mean fortunate or happy. Really, the word blessed is is a good word. I don't think that you would improve on it by saying fortunate are you or happy are you. When you think about happiness in our English uh, way of understanding happiness, There are a lot of things that can cause an individual to be happy for a time, and that's circumstances. But here, blessed really has a connotation that I especially like in the light of what is being said and the purpose for which our Lord was saying. But let me run through, and I want to show you how we progress in in these Beatitudes. And folks, this is for all of us. This is for the church family. There isn't a thing in these Beatitudes that won't touch you. So watch what I'm saying. That won't touch you. First of all, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor. Now, what do we have here in the poor? It's poor in spirit. Not of spirit, but in spirit. And there is a difference. We have need, N-double-E-D, for a person to recognize his poverty, shows his need. And Jesus Christ, who was rich, became poor, that we who were poor might become rich. See what I'm talking about? So we have need, need. And not only need, but there is a consciousness of a spiritual need. And unless a person is conscious of his spiritual need, you cannot help him. You can't win him to the Lord. You can't do a thing in the world for him until he first of all recognizes his need. His spiritual need. And by the very fact he recognizes it, the Lord has already done something for him. He's been quickened. He's been regenerated. So first there is need. N-double-E-D. Need. And he is conscious of spiritual need. But he also knows there is an answer for his need. And the word that is used for poor here is tokas. And we'll give a biblical example of that when we start discussing it in a few minutes. Now notice the second. We're going to build now. We're going to build. We're going from a sense of need. And notice the second one. The second one is sorrow, mourning, and the word, the verb used here is pentheo, So the mourning shall be comforted. And there are three kinds of sorrow. There's a natural sorrow. There's a sinful sorrow. And there is a spiritual sorrow. But this person who feels his need, who knows that he is in poverty, He's a beggar, if you please. He's a beggar. And we're all, we came into this world, and if we ever if we ever come to know the Lord and we recognize our need, we're spiritual beggars. Now, I'm not talking about people sitting out on the street, folks. I'm talking about recognizing that if any good ever comes to you, it must come outside of you and must not come from within you. But now the second stage, the second beatitude, mourning. This is true repentance. True repentance. 
So the person who feels his spiritual need, there is secondly, genuine, true repentance. You know what I believe today? I believed it for a long, long time. Most of the preaching is such today that there is no place for repentance. Did you know the dispensationalists do not see any value whatsoever in repentance? That's why, folks, we have so many lost church members today. I can relate with this. And every recipient of God's grace can relate with this. And if you can't relate with this, then, folks, you've never had a genuine conversion experience. Mourning, that's number two. Now notice number three. The meek, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But we're just emphasizing to begin with this morning and laying it all out before you before we start discussing each one. The meek. Now the word for meek is praus, and praus means gentle or meek. Actually, you can get the word submissive out of it. So here is the person who is now submissive to God. So go back. First of all, there is need. And one knows his need. He feels his need. He's poor. Spiritually poor. And then mourning over the condition. Genuine, true repentance. And then following that, folks, is submission to the will of God. Folks, that'll preach, won't it? Isn't that the order? And I don't care who you are. You experience this. You may not have recognized it, but you experience this just in the order in which I am giving it. So submissive to God's will. Then notice the next one. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Hungering is pinao, and the other is dipsao for thirsting. Now, there are three kinds of righteousness I'd like to just set before you at this point. There is, first of all, imputed righteousness. And you're familiar with that. Secondly, imputed. Imparted righteousness and imparted righteousness that took place when the righteousness wrought out by Jesus Christ at Calvary was imparted to you in regeneration. Imputed, imparted. Now let's look at the third one. Sanctifying righteousness. Now what kind of righteousness is this? This is not imputed. This is not imparted. But it is sanctifying righteousness. Sanctifying righteousness. You didn't have a thing to do with imputed righteousness. You didn't have a thing to do with that which Jesus Christ wrote out for you at Calvary. You didn't have a thing to do with the impartation of that righteousness in regeneration. Born of God is the language of Scripture. You didn't have a thing to do with it. But folks, this is not talking about either imputed or imparted, but it's talking about sanctifying righteousness. That which takes place throughout our lives as Christians. And notice, and we know how this takes place, hungering there is a voracious hunger, a voracious appetite for the Word of God, thirsting for the things of God. Now go back and let's review them. These first four are so... They're just inseparable, folks. They're inseparable. A need, true repentance, submissive to the will of God, and a voracious appetite for the things of God that pertain to sanctifying righteousness. 
Well, what about all of these church members today? They don't study. They don't apply themselves. Well, I believe back under. I made a decision. I did this. I did that. Folks, they don't know what it's all about. And hopefully that isn't true with some in this church family, but I'm not taking anything for granted. I said, I'm not taking anything for granted. And those of you who know the Lord, you rejoice, you're rejoicing even now when you see this presented in Scripture because you can relate with these things if you are a recipient of God's grace. Then we come to number five. Blessed are the merciful. But notice, going back, hungering and thirsting for righteousness shall be filled. Shall be filled shall be satisfied. And then number five, merciful. Blessed are the merciful. What does this mean? And the reward for it, if you want to call it that, the fruit of it, shall receive mercy. But what's he talking about? Being merciful is the labor of love. The labor of love. So being merciful is characterized by exercising mercy. Exercising mercy. Then number six. Clean. Blessed are the clean. Blessed are the pure in heart. And uh, the word that is used is katharos. And metaphorically, clean from guilt. Sincere, upright. Clean. And not shall see God, but horao shall understand God. Folks, God is not going to reveal anything to you. You and I cannot understand the things of God unless we are clean. We are sincere. There is an initial cleansing. And that's by the power of God. This is not what he's talking about. Then there is a continual cleansing. And that's what he's talking about. Then let's look at the next one. Number seven. Peacemakers. Peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. And those are the ones who are promoting harmony. Promoting harmony. You say, well, how do you promote harmony? By declaring the whole counsel of God, folks. Shall be called. Now this is interesting. Shall be called sons of God. Now don't get mixed up on this. This doesn't mean that because you're promoting harmony that you're going to become the sons of God. That isn't what it says. Shall be called. Shall be called. God has already called us this. But we shall be called sons of God because we are promoters of harmony. You know, Paul said, as much as life within me. In other words, he wanted to be at peace with all. As much as life within me. That doesn't mean peace at any price, folks. And then coming to the last one. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Persecuted. For righteousness' sake. Blessed are the ones who have been persecuted for the sake of of righteousness. What is this? This is perseverance. 
all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now let me run back through them. I want to start developing them, and I'll, I'll, I'll begin with the first two this morning. I think I can cover the first two in maybe 15 or 20 minutes. But do you see what we're talking about? Need. Need. You don't feel your need apart from the grace of God. That's emptying of self. That's self-emptying. Mourning, genuine, true repentance. Number three, submissive to the will of God. Notice the order. Notice the order. Voracious appetite for sanctifying righteousness. Because you're already righteous before God by imputed righteousness and positionally by imparted righteousness, legally by imputed, positionally by imparted. But this is sanctifying righteousness, a voracious appetite for the Word of God. Do you have it? Labor of love. Being merciful simply means exercising mercy. Clean. This is not the initial cleansing, but this is the subsequent cleansing. And we are even to cleanse ourselves, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. And then peacemakers promoting harmony. I believe that every child of God who can relate with each one of these things as he goes step by step up, When he gets to this place, he wants peace. He wants to live peaceably with God's people. Let me use an illustration at this point. You know, I believe in our in our Christian lives, and I know it's true with Juanita and me. We'll soon be married fifty two years. And it's sweeter now than ever before. It was great at the beginning, but it's better now. We understand each other better. The grace of God has solidified it. And folks, as we grow older, we don't grow apart. You see, when love is genuine, Even natural love, when it's genuine, as people get older, they don't just grow apart. And I've seen this. I've seen it. I've seen it among some of my own relatives. I used to go visit some of them, and the time I'd get there, well, one would have to get me off and tell me about what the mate was doing and disagree with, and then the other one before I left would have to get me off and and talk about the wife. Folks, that's rotten. That's rotten. Now, as two people where love is genuine and as they grow and grow old, the the closeness gets greater and greater. But when you see married people, they're not too close now. She does her thing, he does his thing. And when they get older, she does her thing, he does his thing. And there's not the closeness. And folks, let's bring it down to the local assembly. God's people, as we all grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, if it's genuine, and if we can relate with all of these beatitudes, we get closer and closer. More meaningful is our Christian lives. And then finally... Perseverance. Perseverance. You don't have to worry about one who can relate with each of the first seven. Don't worry, he'll persevere or she'll persevere. Let's look at number one. Blessed are the poor in spirit. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, emptiness precedes fullness. So when I think of poverty, I think of emptiness. And emptiness precedes fullness. What do you mean by that? We have to be emptied of self-righteousness. We have to be emptied of self-love. We have to be emptied of self-importance. You know, as I was thinking about this one last week, I'm amazed how the Lord has used this little old congregation, bunch of nothings. Are you listening to me? Just a bunch of, just a few nothings. And He's used us in a great way. And folks, it's of God. We don't have anybody who is wealthy. We don't have anyone who is a great scholar, and I don't think we have anyone who thinks he is. If he does, he gets it knocked out of him pretty quick. We have just a bunch of Christians empty that God can use and fill. We have to be emptied of self-importance. Have to be emptied A lot of things pertaining to self. Self esteem. Self confidence. Self sufficiency. And we could go on and on. Folks, what I'm saying is poor in spirit. Now, in order for me to illustrate this, and I have the information before me and I've worked it out. It would take the next 20 minutes, so I'm going to have to... I won't even get through the first 10 verses today at the rate we're going. But let's look at a few things. Poor in spirit defines the area of poverty. The area of poverty. Everyone is poor by nature in the realm of the spirit. So the word poverty extends to physical There is such a thing as physical poverty. There is such a thing as social poverty. And there is such a thing as spiritual poverty. You read where one of the churches in in, in Asia, in Revelation 2, Smyrna was poor but rich. Laodicea was rich but poor. So folks, you can be rich and be poor. So we're talking about spiritual poverty. I'm not concerned about monetary wealth, and I don't think any of you are. All we want is a living. That's what we've tried to provide for ourselves and our families, and that's honorable. But there is such a thing as social poverty. What do you mean by social poverty? Let me give you, I'd take me 15 minutes to develop this the way I've done it in my Bible, but I'll just, I'll just tell you about it. You know, the time came in the life of the Apostle Paul when they all forsook him. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. They all forsook him. Folks, that is social poverty. Even his comrades forsook him. And you've heard me say, and I can prove it from the second chapter of 2 Timothy. And maybe we need to take time to look at that. Turn to 2 Timothy for a moment. I want to get to this next point. I want to close on this next point. I want to deal with repentance. Share something with you. I shared a little bit with uh, the folk, a little bit of it with the folks Wednesday night. But look at verse 20. Now, in order for you to really understand the verses that I'm going to read, you would have to have an understanding or a basic knowledge of the whole chapter. But I can't do that, so... Let's begin with verse 20. And this follows verse 19, the foundation of God stands sure. Then he says, but in a great house, that's professing Christendom, a great house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also wood and pottery, some for the purpose 
of honor and some for the purpose of dishonor or to dishonor or, or of dishonor. Then verse 21. He says, therefore, if anyone purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel to honor Having been sanctified, notice that perfect passive participle, please. Uh, having been sanctified, useful to the master's, uh, useful to the master. Having been prepared, there's another perfect passive participle, to every good work. Now this thought, every faithful Christian finds himself in a position of isolation which is in proportion to the measure of the knowledge of and faithfulness to the truth of God. And that's why Paul was poor socially. Socially. And then, of course, spiritual poverty. So Christians are the best people on earth. Did you know that? Best people on earth are Christians. You'll buy that, won't you? We've been raised up, to use an Old Testament verse of Scripture, from the dust, and the beggar is lifted up from the ash heap. They are made to sit among princes or nobles and inherit the throne of glory. I'm not lifted up with pride about it, folks. I'm just rejoicing in it. I'm just rejoicing in it. But you might ask the question, well now, what does it mean here for theirs is? And folks, that's a present active indicative of I me. You say, wait a minute. Theirs is the kingdom. Present active. How do you explain that? Does that confuse you? You see, when you understand that, then you'll understand a lot of other things. Theirs is the kingdom. So the kingdom, theirs is the kingdom of the heavens. And this is understood in the same sense as Colossians 1.13 translated into the kingdom of the Son of God's love. Well, how do you how do you explain that? I'm legally in it. I'm not actually in it. And that harmonizes with all of Scripture. Now, when you try to make someone already in it, folks, I can tear it to smithereens with the Word of God. I'm legally in it. I'm legally, I am now legally in the kingdom. But I am not actually in the kingdom. And I will not be actually in the kingdom until the kingdom is established and I inherit it. My inheritance. I receive my inheritance. Now let's close with the next one. The second one is mourning. And those who mourn, blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. There is a built-in comfort with every person who mourns. I'm going to start it, but I may not have time to complete this thought. There's a built-in comfort. Yes, you can be mourning, grieving over your sins, your shortcomings. And unless there is grieving and mourning over your shortcomings, folks, there's no built-in comfort for you. But there's built-in comfort for you. Last Wednesday night, we were discussing the subject of repentance, John's repentance, baptism of repentance. His message was, you repent for the kingdom of the heavens has come near or has approached. Now follow me on this. This is, this is a good place to bring to a conclusion this morning's lesson. As John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus Christ, 
Repentance, according to Scripture, is the forerunner of faith. As John the Baptist prepared the way of Jesus Christ, repentance prepares the way of what? The exercise of faith. I didn't know how big this subject was, and I'd never seen it before. But since that is a fact, what I've just stated, because you will find verses of Scripture like Acts 20, 21. You'll find them in, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, I believe it is, in verse 31. Repentance and faith, repentance and faith. Pre, uh, repentance precedes faith. You can't separate the two, but one does precede the other because one is the forerunner of the other. And one prepares the way of the other. First of all, there is the forerunner of repentance before the initial act of what I'll call saving faith or justifying faith before one's consciousness. Romans 5 verse 1, therefore being justified by faith. I said repentance prepares the way for the act of saving faith. Are you with me? And where there is no genuine repentance, there is no act of saving faith. I want that to soak in, folks, because this really cuts across the grain of professing Christendom today. But you know it's true. You can relate with it. Now, since Jesus Christ is the object of saving faith, and the word pistis is used three ways in the Scriptures, first of all, Jesus Christ, who is the object of faith, Galatians 3. Secondly, as the acts of faith which we exercise daily in our Christian lives. We walk by faith, not by sight. And thirdly, the system of truth that God, that God has delivered once for all to you and me before faith came. See? That's the object of faith, Jesus Christ. That's in Galatians 3. And then our acts of faith in our Christian lives. Walking by faith and not by sight. And then striving together for the faith of the gospel, uh, Philippians 1, 27, and Jude, verse 3, once for all delivered to us. Now, let's put this together. Watch this. And folks, this is important. You can test yourself now. There is, number one, the preparation of the initial faith by which you are saved. Justified before your consciousness. Jesus Christ being the object of that faith. Repentance prepares you for it. Where there is no repentance, there is no such act of faith. Both repentance and faith are the gifts of God. So when God gives one, He automatically gives the other. Where there is the absence of one, there is the absence of the other. Are you with me? Now, is that your experience? Come on. Search yourself. Ask yourself the question. When I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, was there any repentance beforehand that prepared the way for this receiving of Jesus Christ? Secondly, as I walk by faith, all the acts of faith which you exercise... They must be preceded, watch this, by a repentant spirit. There is an initial repentance, and then there is a spirit of repentance for the rest of your life. I don't see much repentance today, and the reason I don't see it is because there isn't much God-given repentance. I'm going to have to say it, folks, like it is. I'm going to have to say it like it is. 
So here is a person who talks about his faith, his faith, and he does this, and he does that. Unless there is a spirit of repentance that goes before each act of faith, then there is no real, genuine act of faith. It's just conversation. And finally, when you take this Word of God, which is the Word of the Gospel, the faith of the Gospel, the system of truth, once delivered. Folks, you cannot take this Bible, read it, appreciate it, understand it, unless there is a spirit of repentance that drives you to it and prepares your way for the exercise of your mental faculties in studying the Word of God. You see what I'm saying this morning? So in the first, in the first, a feeling of poverty, a sense of need. And secondly, we're looking at genuine, true repentance. It precedes the initial act of faith in embracing Jesus Christ. It precedes every act of faith in the Christian life if it's genuine. It precedes our considering and our studying the Word of God, the system of truth. What I'm saying is there is always, there is always a spirit of repentance. And where there is not always a spirit of repentance, there was never an initial repentance. Folks, when you see the truth, God gives you boldness. And I can relate with it. And every person can relate his experience, if it is genuine, with the truth of God as the Word of God is unfolded. Let's stand.